This podcast contains potentially sensitive topics and strong language. Listener discretion is advised. There is also a reference to suicide. If you yourself are struggling with suicidal thoughts, we want you to know you're not alone. Dial or SMS 988 if you need to speak to someone. Well, actually, people ask me, what, how did you come to do these, these rocks, stack these rocks? What's up with that? So I tell them, when I was five, I had a childhood trauma. And for, for about a month, I wouldn't, I wouldn't speak, I wouldn't react to my family. And my family took me to, to the doctors, to, and even there was a, a, an American doctor in, in Benghazi. They took me to him and was specialist and said, well, there's nothing physical r- wrong with the kid, but maybe, maybe it's uh, uh, psychological. After a month of not speaking, my grandfather and my grandmother took me to the to the beach and the afternoon there they're sitting on their chairs and I'm not talking. I'm just there. They said, play with these rocks. And so I started playing with them and stacking them. And it kept going, going. And my grandma and grandpa goes, oh, good, Benny, good. I go, isn't that good, isn't that And I started, came back. I came back talking. I'm Rex Holbein, and welcome to You Know Me Now, a podcast conversation that strives to amplify the unheard voices in our community. In these episodes, I want to remind all of our listeners that the folks who share here do so with a great deal of vulnerability and courage. They share a common hope that by giving all of us a window into their world, they're opening an increased level of awareness, understanding, and perhaps most importantly, a connection within our own community. It seems in most families, there is someone living a bit differently from the rest of the family. You could say zigging when others are zagging. Their lifestyle or life choices are engaging and thought-provoking in one moment, perplexing, challenging, and even maddening in the next. And while it is not always the case, in general with family, in the more difficult moments, we work to find ways to be inclusive and supportive. In other words, we try our best to make room for each other. Uncle Maynard, who marches to a different drummer, getting eye rolls around the Thanksgiving dinner table, is accepted rather than pushed away. How far beyond family and close friends does this reservoir of acceptance extend? Do we react similarly when somebody in our community is marching to a different drummer? Do we make room for them? Do we work to be inclusive and supportive in the way we do for Uncle Maynard? Today I'm talking with my good friend Benny. He has lived homeless in the Fremont neighborhood, artfully stacking stones on the parking strip in the same place for the last 30 plus years. I begin by asking Benny to tell us a little about Libya, where he grew up. You know, Libya, from even the ancient times, I could say it was like, not like the United States as far as the mixture of cultures. It was like a a stop station for civilizations. So it got got mixed. There's a lot of ethnicities. There's blue-eyed Libyans. There's uh, medium-dark Libyans. There's black Libyans. There's... And and we all speak the same same language. Yeah, that's beautiful. And uh, so Libya was touched by so many civilizations... And and that that's a beautiful thing about my country that I, that I love, but it also has the misfortune of colonization. Like at some point, Libya was colonized by 
three or four different powers at the same time. France in the south, England in the in the west, Italy in the in the east. But that that didn't even affect the the people's sense of unity. And then you know when in in Libya had the its independence in 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 fifty one, and until sixty nine, it was a kingdom. So the incidents I was telling you about it was during the kingdom, when I was five years old. You had a monarch. Had a yes, we had a monarch, King Idris. The incident Benny referred to was a traumatic and defining moment in his life. He was only five years old, a trauma that would eventually bring him to Seattle. I asked Benny to tell us a bit about that painful day. It's a well-documented incident, event in, in Benghazi. In, in 1964, three students were, were killed at the school for protesting. And one of them is is my cousin, but very very close. And he, he's you know loved young man, and his mom, which is my aunt, is, and she she wanted to throw herself from the second floor. And yeah, and how old was he, your cousin? He was um, eighteen. The school was called uh, Benghazi, and then after that it was the the martyr martyrs of January that they, they re- renamed. Uh, so it could be looked up under the the martyrs of January school. So um, it was for my family. It was a trauma for all of the family, and it just. Just seeing the women and the grannies and everybody, it just somehow it touched me. It was too much. It touched me wrong. Yeah. And that's what the, the trauma was for me. The thing is what, why I was traumatized and not my, my brothers is because, okay, my older brother was in school. My younger brother is a baby. And the news came when that, 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 the killing of these students, the ladies, I was with the ladies when they got the news. Yeah, and you saw they them all break. ran out barefooted toward the school. Must have been horrific. And I chased them barefooted. And so that's why and my brothers were not affected by it. Yeah, they didn't experience it the same way. They, they didn't experience it the same way. They found out later after, but I saw the horrified ladies Running barefooted and stuff. Yeah. You were part of their their horror in that moment. In that moment. Because I just happened to be the right age where I'm not in school, where I'm not a baby. Like my baby brother, he was with the grandma. He didn't know. Just went right over him. Yeah, he was just tiny baby, yeah. Witnessing the distress of his aunt, mother, and other family members altered the course of Benny's life. He attributes his personal mental health issues to this one incident, an incident that set into motion his lifelong relationship with the stones he stacks, a journey of art and healing. What did your father do for work? He had a, a, a grocery shop and um, a hardware shop mm. in the old market. Oh, we used to, we all hung out in the shops. So you got to work there and be there. And- mm-hmm. My father was into the pickling business he did, he pickled olives and things and so we had we had a big basement full of the barrels i come from a big family so the my older brothers the older ones they have each one they have their own room and then the younger ones two of them in a room and then all of us the little guys all in a bunk room so when I was 12, I took all of my, I went above the, the roof of the house. I was t- throwing my, my books and my art supplies and everything. I want my own room. Everybody's standing there. Mom is standing there. Like, you, you can't. I mean, you're not, the older guys have their rooms. And in the middle ones, two in a room. 
Then the little guys, which I was one of, I... I you got it in your head. I got it in my head. I want my own room, my own my own. And throwing the stuff. Everybody's like, couldn't, couldn't say anything. Just wait, waiting, and dad, dad walks in. He, he sees all the stuff on the ground. And everybody's standing against the wall there. What's going on? They go like, oh, he's up there. He he wants his his own room. Dad goes like, you want your own room? Okay, come on down. I'll take care of you. So I I come down. I come down. He goes, okay, here's the deal. You want your own room. So the basement where we're... He has his pickling business in there. He goes, there's the corner of the basement. The corner over there is, is dark and empty. And so he goes, okay, your brothers are going to paint it for you. They're going to do partition. And they're going to put a, a bright light there for you. And your bed and your table and everything. Your own room. Your own room. I go like, okay. So I spent the rest of the time until I came to America in that, in the pickling room, smelling the olives and the. <laughs> but it was fun. It was my own room. And uh, my oldest brother put Elvis Presley on the wall. <laughs> now, wait a minute. Didn't the other youngins kind of go, hmm? Look what Benny just did. I know, I know. No, they <laughs> they waited their turns until the older ones moved. Yeah. Got married and everything and they, they moved they up the ladder. They stayed in line. They stayed in line. They moved up the ladder. <laughs> you were a rule breaker from the beginning. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> <it's> like, <laughs> when Benny was nine years old, another major event took place in Libya. And then Gaddafi came in sixty nine. I was nine years old when Gaddafi came. I stayed in Libya until I was 20. Yeah, till 1980. I finished, I finished uh, high school there. Then, then I went to Europe. I did uh, uh, almost a year at the University of Perugia, Italy. I did a year there waiting on the, on the U.S.'s visa. Then a year in Europe, and then I came here at the age of 21. And, and why did you want to leave Libya? Were you leaving something or going towards something? No, I, I was leaving something. I left in 1980, but in 77 and 78, that's when Gaddafi got really brutal and did the public hangings, and he actually executed university students in the streets hanging and I couldn't take that anymore I wasn't and remembering that was my, my old trauma but now I'm older I couldn't take it no I never I never wanted to leave Libya yeah but for your mental health you knew you needed to I, I had to arriving in Perugia Italy Benny studied art and history, as well as learning English and Italian. He was preparing for his adult life, for the adventure ahead of him. In, uh, in, in Italy, my, my father and my mother came to see me, and they spent two months with me. That was the last time I see them. Hmm. Are they, either of them, living still? No, they're, they're both passed. I had my parents all to myself in Italy. Both my parents lived under the Italian colonization, so they spoke Italian fluently because the Italians were there in, in Libya. Yeah. And, and Italy, when they colonized Libya, they changed the names to all... All the names became Italian. Yeah. Banco de Roma, this, this, that. Everything is Italian. Why America? Like you had the whole world to choose from. Why did you decide to come to America? You know, I did a lot of reading when I was young, and I was impressed with America since I was young. I've read a lot of things. I've read the, the American history and stuff like that, and 
so I it made an impression on me when I was young. And I didn't want to stay in Italy because it was it was so close to to Libya and and in the in the eighties Gaddafi did what it was called the physical liquidation of all the Libyans abroad. He actually killed a lot of Libyans in Rome and uh, wow. Germany and England, and so it was it, it wasn't safe. Well, the history is full of those people. Yeah, so in, uh, I came to the States here. I landed in La Guardia. Okay. I was so impressed, man. I was looking from the, from the plane down. Whoa, this is New York, baby. This is what they're talking about. Mm, and you're coming from another world. And you're 21 years old. Yes. It's all in front of you. Yep. Went to Los Angeles. By then, my English was... Okay. Did you know what you wanted to do at that point? I didn't. I was just showing up. I didn't have a clue, and the the world was so... My world, at least, was so kind of confused because of the political situation that I was coming out of and what was going on, you know? You could see the result of it today in Libya. Libya is, is not in a good shape. And that's that's the result of all of that stuff that happened back then. Yeah, yeah. it's still reverberating through. Yeah, well, the, the the place is split now on itself. And that's because of all the, the stuff that was happening then that I was that you left. a victim of, sort of. I don't want to say victim because... But you were traumatized by it and it, effect, it, effect, it affected you. Yes, Yes, it has. After a short stay in New York City, Benny moved to Los Angeles, and then, six months later, to New Orleans. New Orleans. <laughs> oh, this is the... Yeah. In New Orleans, I spent in New Orleans from 82 to, to 87, 18, 88. What did you do in New Orleans? I, I went to uh, Loyola University. It's a Jesuit Catholic university. Yep. I studied philosophy of the of the dark ages of the medieval ages. That, that was my concentration, you know, philosophy. You, you take you do all you do the history, you do the ethics, you do the this the that, but you concentrate on this one particular one particular area and my area was medieval philosophy. I studied the the Christian philosophy and Islamic philosophy and Jewish philosophy. I uh, studied uh, St. Thomas Aquinas and Spinoza and uh, the Islamic, because the, the, the Middle Ages, that's where the Islamic civilization was. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of, lot of, lot of uh, like deep thought packed into that head of yours, right? I mean, that's a pretty beautiful time of your life. Yes. While studying at the university, Benny was keeping in mind his lifelong interest in teaching. When I was a boy, and with the family having some kind of event, wedding, or this, or this, or the other, I would actually be in charge of the little guys. i just give them chairs and everything and play school. I'll actually give them assignment. Yeah. Headmaster Benny. Exactly. And, and, and keep an eye on them. The, my job was to keep an eye on them. Yeah, but you were going to make the most of it, though. They were, they were also going to learn something. Exactly. Oh, and I, 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 I grade them and I reward them and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I, I did want to teach. Yeah. Benny, how are you going to school and paying for, you know, living arrangements and food? How are you, how are you making money during that time? Well, I had student loans. Picking up odd jobs. Every odd jobs. I was, I, no, I was working while I was going to school. In fact, when the, uh, I was at the university when the, when they had the, the Republican convention, I was working at over at the um, Intercontinental Hotel. And, um, you know, I, um, I met Henry Kissinger personally. How did that happen? I was the captain of the of the room service 
and the Republican convention was held there in New Orleans. So the the penthouse room up there where I didn't know who was who's in there, but they told me, okay, you need to because I was the captain. You need to take brand new TV out of the box, take it to the the penthouse. So I had a couple of guys. We carry get that TV in there. There's a couple of guys, security standing right there. And so I go in there. I plug the TV and put it situated like this. There's somebody in the shower. And as soon as I put it and I'm going like this, testing it, this man comes out in his robe. I look and go, what? <laughs> you recognize him immediately. Yes. It, we were like this. Yeah, just right up front. Right there. And me and him in the room. And security outside. Mr. Kissinger, I said, oh, sir, what a pleasure meeting you. Yeah. Yeah. Where are you from? I go, I'm from Libya. <laughs> what was your impression? I've heard of the man, like he's known around the Middle East and our the world. world there. Yeah. So I, I've known of him, but uh, um, I was impressed. He's an old politician, you know. Well, he was nice, but he was in his robe. I mean, I can't see that. The white robe, hotel robe, you know. You're probably one of a very few number of people that have seen Henry Kissinger in his robe. Uh-huh. Probably. <laughs> I mean, probably. For real. I swear, man. For real. Yeah. Mm-hmm. While at the university, Benny was living with roommates. But after they graduated and went on to jobs in different cities... Benny stayed in New Orleans for a while, unclear about his next steps. We were living in, in this house, but we all graduated. They all went back home, it's like Connecticut, this, this, that. I had nowhere to go, so I stayed a little longer in New Orleans. Then I go like, everybody's gone, I don't... So um, I decided to move here. To Seattle. To Seattle, <laughs> yes. Let's see, that's right after the Seattle Sonics won the, uh, the NBA championship. Uh-huh. We, Seattle was just becoming known. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Did you take a bus here or a no, train? No, I t- drove. He drove. I drove. I had, a, I had a Honda. I drove all the way. With the undergraduate philosophy, you can't really do much. But I, um, I applied for a master at the UW. Did you get into the UW? For a semester, but then uh, the finances weren't feasible, and so I... You dropped? I dropped. Around that time, Benny met a woman and fell into a romantic relationship. And while I don't know much about her, I do know Benny was very much in love. They started a landscaping business doing ornamental rockery hardscaping for clients around Seattle a business they had together for about eight years, when suddenly the relationship ended, and with that, the business as well. This was a devastating time for Benny. He was heartbroken, and it was the beginning of a spiral downwards. I got in a little trouble, and a lot of drinking, a lot of, you know, and um, then I, I, went, I went to rehab for, for a month. For alcohol? Yeah. And, uh, and that... that for for a while I was I was sober, but then I I went back to it, and um, then I went just straight to the rocks, because that's the only thing that can, would keep keep me keep my sanity. And and why weren't you able to just keep doing landscape? Why why did you decide to? Were you just emotionally just... emotionally just drained? I I just couldn't do it. Yeah. And so I moved to Fremont and um, went to my childhood love, which is stacking the rocks. Life was falling apart for Benny. He began living out of his Westphalia van. He was homeless for the first time in his life. I went to showers at, at, the, at the church. At the urban rest stop. Uh-huh. And I had, I had a van that I slipped in and parked right by the church. Mm-hmm. An old uh, Westphalia, 
I wasn't beat up, but but I had it right squeezed right next to the church, and the church was were nice to me. I didn't have to. They let you move it. Let me be there, and it has a sliding door. It's like a little house. Yeah. So I stayed there. That's where I stayed, right by the steps. Benny met an older woman, an architect by the name of Anne, who lived in the Fremont neighborhood. They would become great friends. Often Anne let Benny spend the night on her couch. On one of those occasions, on his way to the corner grocery store, Benny found something important. I go like, well, I'm going to go to that little bodega store. So I went there to get a few things. And I just looked across the street, and and I just went and sat there. By the bodega store, there were milk crates. I took one, and I went across the street. I sat down, and I was just looking at the road and looking around me. And and then on the side there, there were just just few rocks just thrown around, you know, homeless rocks. And so I... I, gra- rocks. I know, I, gra- I grabbed them. <laughs> Benny. <laughs> <laughs> I grabbed them and I played with them right next to me in the crate. By the, by the evening, I went up all these streets to find more homeless rocks with my milk crate. And then few people brought me some few rocks, you know. And then, like two weeks into this... I had like about 10 to 15 small stacks. One day a lady comes, an old lady, she's on a cane. She starts going all around the rocks. Uh, I said, my name is Benny, and I made these rocks. She goes, it's like having your own little park, ain't it? I go like, yeah, yeah. And so a month into into doing this, I have accu- accumulated a whole bunch of rocks. And I wanted to go to to Hawaii to stack rocks there for a couple of weeks. So I couldn't leave the rocks there. I, I had just been there for two months. I wasn't yet familiar with the, with the neighbors and everything. I can't just leave rocks here. There was uh, there was a, a house that all the grass front yards the grass is grown it has no fence or anything nobody maintain it has no fence and so I had this crazy idea I hand trucked all of my rocks and I built a wall because I've done that for other people's houses yeah for your work for my work yeah. All of the rocks went in there and looked really nice. Looks like... And you didn't ask anybody, though. I didn't ask anybody. You just did it. I just did it. And I went to Hawaii for a month. Oh, then you just left. (laughs) I left. (laughs) I came back, brought my hand truck, and as soon as I put two rocks on the the hand truck, these, these couple from the window, they were, hey, 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 and they come out. They go like, hey, 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 wait, we got to knock on the door. Miss Garrison. They knock on the door. This old lady come out. They go like, Miss Garrison, this is the guy we told you he was putting the rocks. Now he's taking them. Now he's taking She goes, she, she said, well, what's your name? I said, Benny. She goes, oh, Benny, I thought the, the city made them. I go like, no, ma'am, I, I put him, but if you want me to leave him, I'll leave him. She goes, no, 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 Benny. You take these rocks, and also you take the ones in the backyard, because the, they, ter- they tear down the, they're gonna make it a condo. I don't want the rocks to go into the, to the fill or to the dump. So take these rocks, and take, and she had a plenty of rocks, beautiful rocks. In the back. So I told the neighbors, oh, well. <laughs> it's like your rocks doubled. Like, yeah, like, like they doubled. You put them here, they had babies. He came back. and <laughs> I swear, man, I spent two days Yeah. hauling rocks back to the... Yeah. And then 
I started making the big stuff. And talk about maybe when the neighbors started first noticing you there, right? Like, like I mean, this was something different. I'm sure they were like wondering, what's this man doing? <laughs> Did What were those first relationships like? The stranger had a did an article about me. It was called Hanging in the Balance. And they had they interviewed some people. Some people go was like, Oh, this is great, this is unique, this is this and others didn't like go like I don't know what he what he's doing here. It's it's the and so once somebody said, Oh, he's a uh, charming savage <laughs> A, a, what a charming savage! <laughs> <laughs> In the article, I swear, man, I go like, "What?" <laughs> How did you feel? I just went, <laughs> <laughs> "Whatever." <laughs> yeah, but there were—I do know there were some people not happy with you there. No. Yeah. Why do you think that? Why do you think that is? Like, what can you explain that, or is that just if you're going to have a hundred people? 25 are going to be unhappy. You know, that, in that period of time, there were a lot of homeless people in, in Fremont, you know, and hanging out on the on 36. Yep. A lot of them. Yeah. And we hung out together. I hung out with these guys. And and then I went and did my rock. So they, they might have gotten the ideas that, you know, just... Your trouble. Yeah. Yeah, homelessness was not looked up on kindly those days, I think. Or these days. Or these days. So you you went to this place almost just by chance for no real reason and you started to make your you're stacking your rocks. Was it a was it a mental health thing for you, emotional thing? Like like why were you there? Were you were you healing? What Yes. Yes. Can you talk about that? I was. Well, I told you, I just got out of a relationship that I really wanted it to to continue. And and I was really hurt by it and, and brought the childhood memories of being hurt and everything. And I didn't want to go any further. Yeah. And were you still sleeping at Anne's place? Yes. So you were getting up in the morning and saying... See ya, Ann. I'm uh-huh. going. I'm going to the office. Right. And you would show up down here. And that's here. exactly what I called it, the office. Some people couldn't understand. Like somebody shows up on the sidewalk on the, in the street and start <laughs> stacking rocks. Yeah. I want to share a story uh, between you and me, and I want to get your reaction. And you know, I love you. Like, uh, like I think you're. You embody for me like what I think we as humans should be doing, like living in a human, a very rich human way, right? And I see that in your art and how you react to people. But there was once when I came to you um, on my bike with a coat and to give you, and you were on the, on the parking strip and you were yelling across the street at folks and you were pretty upset. I don't know what happened or I don't know if if you were having a very emotional moment, but when you saw me, you you kind of yelled out at me like, what are you doing sneaking up on me? And and then we had a little moment where you were pretty angry with me and and such. Was that a mental health moment or was that maybe drugs or was it an, just emotional? Or? Emotional. Do you remember that moment? Yes. What was, what was your, what's your side of the memory? And let me, let me also, I want to say something else to you, Benny. By the time that had happened, I already, I actually like, not fall in love with you, but loved you. Like really, like really, like I just, I'd never met anybody like you. And so when I got down to the end of the block, and my heart was pounding (laughs) because you were pretty upset at me. Like my number one feeling was to just feel bad for you. Like it wasn't like I was mad. It was more that I, I could see that you were having a really hard time. And to be fair to our friendship, it was the only moment in our friendship ever, right? Like there was like a little bit of like, whoa, what's going on here? Yeah, it was was a bad time for me. Um, you know, I've went through some some bad times. Uh, I, I'm glad I had the, the rocks next to me because that helped quite a bit. But 
you know, I, I, I did have a emotional times because of either past traumas or, or just um, triggering. Yeah, this probably was triggered by something or another. It happened a number of times. First, I want to say thank you for letting me ask that question and, and for answering it. And I also want to say that, like, you lived your life out in public. Everybody has hard times, and they get to go behind doors and have their hard times. And, you know, I think that's one of the things that's really difficult for people that live homeless is that they, everything is out there, right? Like, mm -hmm. like everything. Exactly. I have thought often of this moment with Benny, a scene that included him taking a missed swing at me and then chasing me 25 feet or so, kicking at my bike and yelling. If I had not first gotten to know Benny, to know how beautiful he is, to see him honestly as family, my view of this interaction would have been completely different. I would have, like most people I think, have been angry and jumped on the phone to call the police. Rather, I was overcome by worry for him, like we all would for a brother. The more we know each other, the more we understand each other. And in the understanding, we find ways to make room for each other. I made a, a visit to the, to the Grand Canyon. And um, that's when I was at, uh, at the university. I went on a sabbatical to to meet with the Native Americans. I did the, the talking circle, the sweatshop. So the third night, they administered a, a little bit of peyote for me. They knew how to, and there's the fire, and all these medicine men and women are sitting. When the, when the peyote took effect, I, I just w left them all sitting and went over there. And they were all kind of rocks all over, just scattered. I go and start stacking them up. And when I finished, nobody said anything. Everybody was just watching. When I, when, when I finished, I come and I, I, I sit down. And one of the, one of the medicine men, and, and they said, you're the stone dancer. So it was given to you, the name. Uh huh. Wow, that's beautiful. By Native Americans. Yeah. And uh, did you know at that moment that would be your your name? I mean, were you going to? It became it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. How did you come to be so good at it? Did you did you think that you have a? Is it a? Was it a natural talent or was it a? Because I'm I'm gonna say or was it just practice? Because I still when I see you balance what looks like an impossible stone sitting on a point on the top of one of your sculptures, I think, is it like magic? Or I mean, seriously, it's really quite extraordinary. They, you know, um, I've been asked that question. How, how, do you, how do you do this? And really, it's when I hold a rock, I'm inside of it. I, I know how I need to be moved. This is as very it comes like just like that. You know where that point is. When I hold it, I'm, I know how I need to be moved. Yeah, like you have to be balanced. Exactly. And so it it exactly you find you find like a human would standing on a one foot would know how to balance. Exactly. Benny continued to spend nights on Anne's couch, but also outside with his rock sculptures. His claim space was in front of the Professional Engravers Building on 36th in Fremont. He would build and rebuild his rock sculptures there. Some, some days I'd, I'd call Anne and I'd tell her, I'm not coming home tonight. I would spend the night there. Yeah, and I spent a lot of nights there. Just laying on the ground? Well, um, you know, I, uh, I either slip behind the fence or or I had like a couple of, couple of chairs one to sit on and one to put my feet on and just a blanket and and why were you choosing to do that when you had it? I because I was so close to the rocks and I 
I has I was making spectacular pieces, and I did not want them to. And only later in the years where I I got known, and I wasn't as much worried about the rocks. Yeah, you were in the flow. Uh-huh. You you and the rocks. Uh-huh. You were making it happen. Yep. And you didn't want to leave them. No. The Professional Engravers Building is actually a hidden professional recording studio called Studio Litho. Many famous musical groups such as Pearl Jam, Soundgarden, and Dave Matthews Band recorded their iconic albums there. I had a chance to sit down with Ed Brooks from Resonant Mastering, who had been the manager of Studio Litho during the same time period Benny was out front creating his sculptures. Uh, My name is Ed Brooks, and uh, I'm an audio engineer that's lived in Seattle all of his life. For a 25-year stretch, I was the manager of a studio in Fremont called Studio Litho. Through the years, Ed witnessed a great amount of change in the Fremont neighborhood. Fremont, 23 years ago, looked a lot different than it does now. And there were big empty lots with people living in buses, and it was, I guess, kind of an economically down area. And so our studio was built in an old brick building that had been like a screen printing shop, and it was relatively inexpensive real estate. And so at at the same time, we once the studio was going, we kind of were running into a problem because we had a recessed door and people would sleep in it at night. And it was like, we, we didn't know what to do. We were, you know, a bunch of young music engineers who just wanted to make music and... And not deal with everything And not deal else with everything on. else that's going on in the world, yeah. So I don't know, I got to the studio one day and person who was working there said to me hey have you seen the the rock dude i'm like what goes yeah go check this out and out in front of the studio there were these stacked rock sculptures and i was like whoa i've never seen anything like that and i don't think benny was there at that time and i think it might have been a couple of days later I would actually finally meet him. And I was just in awe of the rocks. And at that point I'm like, oh wow, this is great. We have this kind of eclectic street artist hanging out in front of our place, stacking rocks. This is this is good. You know, the aesthetic, just what it meant. Yeah, the vibe was right. Yeah, it just felt really good. So much so that I remember I was like we were gonna go to lunch and I'm like, hey Benny, you want a sandwich? And you know, he, he bought him a sandwich like he was part of the crew. Pretty quickly realized Benny was homeless, and he had claimed the space. I hate to say it like this. He was cleaner. He was an artist. It, it just seemed like, oh, this is this is a good solution to our problem. It's mm-hmm. like, oh, if, if Benny's out here, this is great. Meaning he's going to keep other people away that maybe were more troublesome or less clean or yep. any of the above. Yep. I mean, I think that we all realized it, that he had established himself there and that it was a better situation than it had been previous to Benny showing up. Give me an example of what was going on uh, prior to Benny showing up. Uh, no, other than it just smelled like people were peeing on the door and, you know, a band would be showing up and we'd go to open the front door and have to shove on it and there would be somebody against it. It was just, it was always just something. Yeah. And it was, you know, it was intimidating. Because you didn't know. Didn't know and also at this point I was just trying to run a business and this was just an annoyance for my business. In the beginning, Benny was a welcomed presence, but over time, issues began to appear. The thing that I, I didn't know and learned from Benny is that people like to collect possessions. And he liked to collect rocks. That was the first thing. So suddenly there was a lot of rocks in front of our place. Stuff started showing up. Chairs, furniture. 
and it started spilling over the fence and it started to grow. You know, he's concocted a bed out of chairs and some sort of a, maybe like a door, bridging chairs, and he's built a tent over himself. And it's the winter. It's just fucking cold. So it was, it was little tiny little progressions. Little tiny bits. Yeah. You know, once he started sleeping out there, then I, then I was kind of really facing a problem because like, okay, this... This really isn't okay. You know, I mean, right? I'm the business manager. This isn't. This really isn't okay. For years, Ed found himself feeling conflicted. On one hand, he appreciated Benny and was trying to make some room for him to allow him to express himself and also find some shelter. On the other hand, Ed had a business to run. Yeah, this is kind of where, like, you know, my heart's breaking, and I'm totally conflicted. I don't know what to do about it. I mean, I'm just going, this is bad for the business. Like, the the place is kind of getting trashed. Everybody involved with the studio is going through the same thing I am. There's points where it's like, it's hard on us that Benny's there. We also totally care about him. And then it started to get harder. Late at night, he started to make a lot of noise. And he would be making a lot of noise out front. And so much so that sometimes people who were working there would actually have to tell him to quiet down because they could hear him. In the recording? In the recording. Oh, God. Because he was was so loud. Now, at some point during all of this, you know, I had told him, you you know, you can't do this. We have a business and... You know, sometimes people are scared of you if they're coming out of the studio and, you know, I can't have you out here. And it it was just like a horrible, hard conversation. You had this initial kind of getting to know Benny and and it was, if for lack of a better word, it was a little bit of a honeymoon. Yeah. Basically really impressed and taken with him and his artwork and, and, um, and it felt like a good thing for the kind of occupying that space. Yeah. But then over time, it it probably began to morph. Yeah. And it became more stressful. Yeah. Did that show up also in your guys' relationship? Was it tougher to be, hey, Benny, good morning? Oh, it was totally. I mean, it, it got to the point where I was always, the, I was the, I was kind of the bad guy. Like, I was the person who was like, Benny, you can't be out here. Benny, you can't do this. Benny, my clients are complaining. And it got to the point where he knew my car. And if he saw me drive by on 36 to loop into the studio, by the time I could actually get out front, he'd be gone. So it was stressful for both of us, right? I, I I was in a role that I didn't want to be in, and... He was in a, I don't want to have Ed tell me I can't sit here right now, so I'm just going to move on. And if I'm there, am I going to go check every 20 minutes to see if Benny's come back? It's like, no. I couldn't manage it all the time. Yeah. You had this this very up-close relationship with him in the sense that he was out front of your business. Yeah. How was his, um, or what was your awareness of his relationship to community? Hmm... I think he scared people. And I mean, and that was the primary feedback that I got. But then I also knew people who liked him. People would stop and talk to him. You know, he was he was a giant personality on that little spot. And you kind of weren't going to walk by him without being engaged. I mean, I I feel like there were times where he was kind of the heart. He was the interest, the soul. He was, it was so unique. And it's wild because now you're, I'm just flashing on another memory where there was definitely some blowback from the Chamber of Commerce in, in Fremont where they were starting to get mad at us for letting Benny be there. Like it was that cross from when Benny was like this celebrity street artist to he's scaring tourists in in the period of time when he was celebrity street artist and he he was 
uh, what's the word I want to use? I want to just say he was the mayor of Fremont. Yeah. He was the... I, I've said it before that, you know, we all know that Fremont is the center of the universe and Benny is the center of Fremont. Yeah. <laughs> He's the center center of the universe. Yeah. Reflecting on his relationship with Benny, I asked Ed for his big picture takeaway. You know, all humans contribute to the community. Myself, I'm obviously partial to art. That's just my interests, and so I totally am attracted to that. That's probably what, you know, obviously got me to connect with Benny. I mean, I would say he was a, he was a friend. He was, you know, a person I cared about, and he was a person I was who I knew was suffering, and and I know that you know this, and you kind of learn it. And it's like there's really nothing you can do to fix that. Yeah, that's Benny's journey. Yep. I think what you shared, Ed, is beautiful, actually. And I think it's honest. I mean, I think Benny provided a complication, but yeah. also an enrichment, too. Yeah. Oh. oh, man, huge. And I learned a lot. And I, th- I think so, kind of almost to tie it all back, I'd been, you know, 20, 15, 20 years with Benny. Yeah. So... I'd been trying to figure it all out on my own, and it's like, there was kind of no help. There was, you know, there was like the hardline corporate and city-wide, like, move them along, don't let them stay. There was never any, like, I never could find any help. There is help out there, but, it, you know, it's so complicated, you yeah. know, and then you throw in, you throw in so many factors like mental health. Well, here's the best way to say it, the old yelled out the car window get a job right it's 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 so completely naive and off the mark it's not even worth responding to because it just shows the complete lack of understanding of how complicated the issue is yeah i just i know how hard people who don't have housing have to work every day to just live it's it's a full timer it's hard Benny spent almost three decades in the Fremont neighborhood, in front of the recording studio, stacking rocks. He met many people along the way and developed deep connections in the neighborhood. As Ed illustrated, it was a complicated balance within the community. I asked Benny to recollect some of his experiences with folks he had encountered along the way. One time, years ago, I was doing a a stack of rocks that wasn't happening. There's this lady comes by me, and I'm stacking rock, but I, for some reason, wouldn't wasn't sitting there. And I tell the lady, "Oh, please, look, just just help me with with this. Just watch me. I'm gonna put this." She goes, no, "I got, I, I'm in a hurry. I gotta go. I'm in a hurry. I'm gonna go. Please, please, just let me do it. Please, it's very important. If you, so I go like this, and for some reason, unlike me, it was taking me." Long time. You were struggling with it. Struggling with it. Couldn't put the... And she was she, like, I gotta go. I go, please, please, please. No, 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 please. Then I bought it. I bought it. I gotta go. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for helping me. She leaves. She comes back, like, several months later with two bags full of groceries and things and little money. And I, I work, and she goes, here, thank you so much. I work, for what? She goes, you remember me? I work, yeah. Her, her name is Holly. She, go, she, she goes, um, when I was coming by here, I was going to the Aurora Bridge to jump. And after you kept me there for this long, I just took the bus and I went to the UW hospital to the psychiatric unit and she said and that's where I that's that's where I met my husband he's a doctor there and and you know I said oh great and she hugged me and she was six months later she showed up again no but more than that the doctor husband was with her she goes, that's Benny. 
And he's like, thank you and, and all of that. And they had a tiny, tiny baby, brand new. She said, we have, we have a baby. Wow. Wow. It's the beauty of reaching out to each other, right? And, and that also says a lot, Benny, about what you meant to the community, sitting there for so long and working and, and interfacing with folks going by. That's, that's amazing. And I still remember those, those rocks. I kept them for a long time. I've seen a lot of kids grow up here. There was a, a kid, his name is uh, Ryan Bartlett. And uh, his, his mom and dad were going through divorce. And he was six years old. And they passed by me. I'm sitting there with the rocks. They want to go to the coffee shop and do some talking. So they leave him there with me and the rocks. Hey, wait a minute. Had you met them before? Yeah. Okay, I, so you knew them. I knew them by passing by, you know, and then they started getting comfortable. Yeah. So... Um, they trusted you. Yeah, so they'd leave Ryan there. And then I start seeing them, like, not as as often because they divorced. And so this kid, 16, 17 years old, come down. It's Ryan. I'm still sitting in the same place. He goes, there's a national competition and I want to get, uh, get into it. And the competition is high school graduates to do a, a seven minute film. I want to get into it. I said, are, are you sure, Ryan? I mean, I'm controversial, you know, and it may hinder your chances. He said, nope, I want to do film about you I go like okay so and he's he comes down there he's bringing me a little lunch uh, I must have given him 70 60 70 hours so we did the canal thing we did talking by the rocks so um, he gets it done he comes to me he said 739 Entries throughout the nation, all the states, and the the, the first prize is a scholarship, full scholarship for film school. And then he comes back three weeks later. He goes, they accepted thirty six of the seven hundred, and I'm one of them. He comes back three weeks later, and I'm sitting by the rocks till late in the. In the evening, their car parks right in front of the rocks. He comes out. He's jumping on me and hugging me. He goes, Benny, I got number one. He went to Los Angeles. He went to Los Angeles for scholarship. And That's beautiful. And finished school there. And he's a filmmaker in New York. That's amazing. And how often do you guys talk? How much do you stay in touch? I mean, he's busy, I'm sure, and... Every, like, couple of months. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the kid just loves me. The kid... Yeah. Well, he's not a kid anymore, but, yeah. That's really beautiful. I just can't even believe it. Not all of Benny's interactions were that fortunate. Over the years, both good and bad came his way. It was, it was about 12 o'clock at night, and I was sitting on my chair... And uh, they um, came right at me and sprayed me with uh, like a lot of... Like pepper spray? Uh Uh-huh. Lots of it. Like mace or something? It wasn't like... No, it was like... And they... Lots of it. And and they didn't... There wasn't anything before that. They just came right up to... They came right... This is the first thing that happened. They didn't say hi or... They just snuck up on me and went like this... And then they they pulled me off my chair and they tried to reach to the to my pocket and and I was yelling and hollering and asking for help and stuff and one of them was trying to get my my wallet and I wasn't gonna let him I had like 120 bucks in there I wasn't gonna lose it so they start like 
hit me in the ribs with their boots. Just kicking you. Kicking me left and right. And by my hollering, somebody heard from across the street. And they came running and yelling. And these guys took a few more hits and run. They went rear right around the canal, called the police and everything. Scary. Mm hmm Wow. Just oh. young young kids. Mm-hmm. I was I was out uh, on that for like a couple of months. Did you go to the hospital? Oh yes, they took me to the hospital and I had seven ribs broken. Both sides. Do you think it was uh, hatred to homeless? Do you think it was just an opportunity to steal? I think it was both. Fremont is known in Seattle as the center of the universe and the case could easily be made that Benny Stone sculptures are the center of Fremont. I asked Benny what it has meant to him to have openly engaged with the community for so many years in the same place, rain or shine, for better or worse, stacking his stones. You know, I, I enjoyed watching people and interacting with them and, and reflecting on myself in public and what mm. have you. But, yeah, it's... It's been a fun journey, you know. I'm I'm not regretting anything. Yes, because uh, I could have been somewhere else. I I could have been somewhere else, um, considering my <clears throat> considering my traumas and my mm. emotional and all of that. Mm. I. Um, it was good for you. It was good for me. Yeah. Yes. You know, this community saved my life. Really. I'm 63 now. It, 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 it taught me a lot about the community and people and uh, helping one another and all this stuff. I, um, I, I, I love this community. I love every moment of it. And it, it has been, it has enriched my, my soul for real. I know I'm not, wasn't doing great things or anything like that other than my art is being there. But I, uh, this sense of community has enriched my, my soul. Without this community, I could have been much worse. I, I think. Yeah. I really think so. I'm thankful. I'm quite thankful. And um, I have great memories with the people here. And, and uh, I, I love this community. What holds us together in community depends so often on how close we are willing to come to each other and how long we are willing to stay there. In those moments of meeting someone living differently or holding different views, we find both the messiness and beauty of relationships. We learn to make space for others. We feel life's vibrancy and in turn grow our own family. There wasn't in the distance between our eyes but the rain. It was an awful dream I told her I had. Oh, it leaves me with such pain. In my dream, there were spears aimed at my heart and hang and stand, dance and over the plain, in the rain. Oh, I told her, it was an awful dream. It was so real. It was insane. She looked at me with her eyes full of rain. <gasps> she sighed. <gasps> she sighed again. And she said, in your dream, do you recognize the faces behind the spears? In your dream, did you hear calling, screaming, or horses running away? In your dream, was it, was it on the river? Was it in the valley? Was it on the hill? And I remember, oh, I remember I told her in my dream, I was riding a wild horse, crossing the raging ocean, searching for top of the hill. And then the green distance appeared. And I told her I felt the ground pulling me toward it the way you do. And when I touched base and I crashed, the stones flew and I split in two. And I found myself in a valley they called Fremontville. Oh, I told her it was so real. 
Benny's dear friend Anne passed away last year. He continues to live in her apartment on her couch. About a year ago, Benny was diagnosed with lung cancer. With chemotherapy, his cancer went into remission, but in March 2023, the doctors determined the cancer had come back. Benny has been given about six months to live. With rent and medical bills, he is in desperate need of financial support. If you are moved by Benny's life story, please consider donating to the Venmo account at Benny the Rockman. All funds will go to Benny. You Know Me Now is produced, written, and edited by Tomas Bernatsky and me, Rex Holbein. We would like to give a heartfelt thanks to Benny and Ed Brooks for taking the time to speak with us. You Know Me Now has a Facebook and Instagram page where you can join in on the conversation. We also have a website at www.youknowmenow.com where you can see photos of Benny the Stone Dancer and his artwork, as well as stories of other folks we feel you should get to know. Thanks as always for listening.